I'm going to hand it over now to Michael Henry, who's an operations forester with West Wind Forest Stewardship. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for in, uh, inviting me here today to uh, talk about historical changes in Georgian Bay. I work for a forest company called Westwind Forest Stewardship. Who is Westwind? Uh, we hold the Sustainable Forest License for the French Severn Forest. We manage crown lands only. We've been issued a Sustainable Forest License by the Ministry of Natural Resources. We're somewhat unique in the forest industry in Ontario in that we're directed by a board of directors that includes community and First Nations representatives, as well as industry representatives. We ourselves do not harvest uh, the wood or have ownership in, in mills, but we carry out forest management planning, civil culture, inventory and reporting, and we're a, a small group of, uh, of folks. The area we manage is the French Severn Forest, uh, basically from the French River to the Severn River. Uh, it's 1.3 million hectares in total area, 700,000 hectares of crown land, and of that, about 300,000 hectares is productive forest. The forest industry in the area creates 2,400 direct jobs. And we've been uh, certified by the Forest Stewardship Council since 2002. In fact, I think we were the, the largest uh, provincial forest to get certified uh, in the province of Ontario. Uh, we have two main uh, forest types in our forest. Of course, the taller and hardwood, sugar, uh, maple, and beech being, being the primary species. And uh, mid-tolerant conifer species, red and white pine. When I talk about uh, tolerance, I'm talking about tolerance to, to sunlight or shade. Mid-tolerant species are somewhat tolerant of shade, but they require eventually require full sunlight to, uh, to thrive and grow. Tolerant uh, tree species such as uh, maple and beech can do quite well under partial shade conditions. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, the historical changes in eastern Georgian Bay. My focus is the French Severn Forest, but similar activities took place all along the bay. Talk about the early settlement era, the industrial era, and the last 20 years, some of the uh, issues, forest health issues that have come up in, in the forest, in the Crown Forest in the last 20 years. So I am a private landowner too, uh, just like you folks are cottage owners, and I've got uh, issues on my property, things that are coming. I've got, uh, I've got ash trees, I've got uh, healthy uh, beech trees, but I've also got beech trees that have had decline. I've had to cut few, a, a few uh, fairly large trees down because they, uh, they're right along the trails, the little trails that my, my kids use, and one of my sons is pointing to uh, beech scale, which is the precursor to uh, beech bark disease. So I understand the concerns uh, that you would have as landowners around the majestic trees on your property. I've got very large beech, and unfortunately, I think I'm going to, over time, going to lose them all. So first, I want to talk about the early settlement era, Perry Sound area. Um, a lot of lumbering went on in the, uh, the late 1800s. Uh, they came for the large uh, majestic white pine, originally for ship mass, but then for, for lumber production. And I was going to show you some slides of, of areas that were, were cut, but I thought I would, I think you can relate more to, say, the town of Perry Sound. You've most of you have probably been to the, the town. Uh, so here's some pictures of uh, the town in the early, early days, and you can see uh, uh, the field. Uh, well, it's not a field, it's rock in, in the, the foreground with a, a number of stumps. Uh, that's what a lot of the forest looked like after the areas had been cut by the, the, uh, the early settlers. The Perry Sound Lumber Company uh, established himself at the mouth of the Seguin River. You can see the, tr the trestle, the concrete trestles on the top slide and the, the, the large dam that was constructed. It's not there now, but it's amazing what the early settlers did in terms of changing and altering the landscape and the impact that it had on, on the forest. Here's another picture on the other side of the dam of, uh, of the trestle being constructed and you can see the lumber piles. You can see uh, the, the water levels in the dam are, are fairly low, but you can see the logs floating in the, in the river. That is the Seguin River and the Seguin River system was used to, uh, to drive logs down, down the river. And here's another picture of uh, Bob's Island. It's the location of the present day Stocky Center and you can see the lumber piles that are piled there. So the area was settled and built on the backs of, of, of loggers and the forest industry. Unfortunately at that time there wasn't much consideration for sustainability. They cut all the trees or a lot of the trees you know with no regard for things like reforestation. They felt that the, the forests were, were endless. And in the, uh, the mid-1900s, the exploitation of the forest resources continued. In the, during the World War II era, yellow birch was high-graded 
and partly used for the construction of mosquito bombers during World War II. The eastern hemlock was not only cut for, for tannin, for the production of tannin, but it was also cut for timbers to be used in the subway systems down here in Toronto. Again, not a lot of regard for sustainable forestry. And then during the, uh, the 50s and 60s and early uh, 70s, sugar maple was a, a species that was quite, quite, cut quite a bit. And again, the larger, healthier trees were favored over the, uh, the poor quality trees. A lot of high grading took place. They took the best and they left the rest and gave no regard for, for sustainability. And literally most of the forests in the Perry Sound area, perhaps not, the, not as, as many of the islands, most of the areas in the Perry Sound area were heavily cut. And if you look at our forest resource inventory, the average age of our forest stands is somewhere in the range of 80 to 120 years, which coincides quite well with, with the early settlement of the area. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about events since uh, around the 1970s to present day. I talked to Joe Johnson, a uh, soon to be retiring uh, forester with the Ministry of Natural Resources. Joe's been an excellent person to, uh, to talk to about the history of forestry in, in the area. Been a great mentor of mine since I've been with Westwind for 15 years now. And so we sat down and we talked about some of the, the issues, the forest health issues that the Crown, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry dealt with from the, from the, the, the late 70s and, until present present day. So first of all, um, he talked about back in 1976-77, there was a small outbreak of uh, the spruce budworm. Spruce doesn't typically occur in, in pure uh, stands, it can, but it, it tends to occur as fingers or scattered individuals in our forests. There were some small pockets affected and uh, there was the use, uh, limited use of some malathion control by the Ministry of Natural Resources at the time. Uh, 1987, there was an outbreak of the forest tent caterpillar. It affects oaks, poplar, and sugar maple. Joe talked about entire hillsides being defoliated, green slime from the number of caterpillars. Uh, he'd come home from the bush and his wife would get mad at him because he had caterpillars in his clothes. And uh, it was quite uh, startling how, how voracious the insects uh, were on, on these trees. No specific uh, treatment was carried out. And although there wasn't uh, mortality, Joe expressed the opinion that if, if there had been successive attacks uh, over a period of say three plus years, there definitely would have been, uh, would have been mortality in these stands. So during the 1980s, there was also uh, some hardwood forest decline, hardwood trees that were declining in, in health, uh, crown dieback, a complete death of the tree. There was some thought that it was a combination of industrial pollution, acid rain, possible drought conditions combined with uh, the forest tent caterpillar uh, infestation. There was hundreds of hectares affected in pockets in and around, the largest pockets were in and around the 12 Mile Bay, Moon River and Seagrin River uh, areas. Uh, entire stands died. Uh, there was uh, some extensive salvage logging and the nice thing and the, one of the messages I want to give today at the end is that, uh, you know, all is not potentially lost. Today we've got in these areas, they've regenerated back to young forests, uh, mainly saplings and poles. So there is the potential for these forests to contribute, to, to grow mature and, and contribute uh, both, you know, for environmental benefits, but also possibly be included in future forest management plans and areas that we may manage in the, in the future. Uh, then there was the gypsy moth, uh, outbreak 91-92. Oak is a preferred host. Private land only. There wasn't a significant impact on the crown and there was uh, treatment. There was a program that the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, undertook using uh, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, and BT is used to this uh, day. There hasn't been a, an outbreak of gypsy moth. I think since that time Taylor can uh, Taylor Scar can confirm that for me. Then uh, the jack pine budworm, 1994-95, uh, seems to be around a 10-year period where they were, they, they've been present. Very shallow, rocky sites, uh, typical if you go up north of uh, Perry Sound, uh, north of Point of Barrel, you, get, you look on both sides of the highway, but certainly uh, to the west, you'll see the, the scattered jack pine uh, growing on shallow, shallow open rock uh, stands in shallow open rock stands. The concern back then was the potential for the jack pine budworm to 
move into the more extensive white pine stands. So there was a, a spray program that was undertaken spraying 25,000 hectares. My understanding is about 5,000 of that was in the Sudbury district. So perhaps the Clarny area was, was included with that in that spray program. Down in our forest, there was a salvage cutting of approximately 1,000 hectares. Now very poor quality timber in, in terms of its size, very small diameter pine. And the, the, rates, the rates that the companies paid to cut the timber uh, was very minimal because it was, it was uh, barely um, a lucrative uh, opportunity for them. But areas were cut. Mowat and Brown Townships and in Harrison around the Argue Lake area, which is very close to Point of Barrel. Uh, but there was a very successful aerial seeding program that the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, undertook using uh, using helicopters. They seeded in March and Westwind began in 1997 as a result of a new relationship with the uh, with the Ontario government and so these this program took uh, the aerial seeding took place in around 96. We've been out to those stands and we've surveyed those stands and they are healthy jack pine stands anywhere from four to eight meters tall and we have done surveys and declared them in forestry terms, uh, free to grow. Uh, they're, they're healthy, uh, well-stocked forests. So that was a very successful program that the Ministry of Nat Natural Resources uh, initiated. So a good news story. Uh, then in the early 2000s, we had extensive drought periods in the summers. Well, there's a few, quite a few summers of uh, seasons of drought. But in, in uh, 2000, I don't know if you recall, but we had hillsides where the, that's all uh, hardwood, uh, maple and oak trees in the background die off of the trees uh, in the summertime, midsummer. The trees did recover. The biggest concern is when you get consecutive years of, of, of drought. We had an excellent site preparation treatment program the year prior to my arrival at Westwind, which created really good seed bed conditions for the natural establishment of, of white pine. The area around the hat in the picture shows several, uh, several white pine seedlings, perhaps uh, two, three inches tall. We got tens of thousands of them coming up that year. And then the following years, uh, most of those succumbed to the drought. The conditions were just too hot. And in the end, we had to... Uh, we had to supplemental plant the areas anyways. So in conjunction with, uh, with drought, we also got, we have pockets of armillaria root rot. They're not extensive, but they tend to occur in, in our uh, pure pockets of red pine and they're evidence from the thinning crowns you can see up here. You can't see in the picture, but there's some browning of branches and there's evidence uh, peeling the, the bark back of the, the bark back of this red pine is uh, mycelial uh, fans. We did some uh, salvage, small scale salvaging of these pockets and, and the objective there is to, to take the infected trees out and to consider reforestation to other species that are less susceptible. So in a red pine uh, stand with, uh, with our malaria root rot, we would consider planting a mix, uh, including uh, white pine and possibly if we've got some fresher sites, uh, spruce, white spruce. The disease spreads through uh, root contact, which makes it very difficult to, uh, to control. Many of you might be familiar with, uh, with the hemlock uh, looper, uh, mostly on private land, seem to impact uh, the islands quite a bit. And the, uh, Joe was telling me uh, a lot of points on islands were impacted by the, the looper. Perry Island had, uh, had the looper as well. Um, there was uh, some spraying of BT, approximately 100, 150 hectares. And it was so bad in places, there were reports that you could, you know, in the adjacent waters, you could put a cup in the water and scoop out a whole cup full of, uh, of the larva. So that was another more recent uh, insect infestation that we, we've dealt with. So now that I've got a whole bunch of you folks here, I've, I've got lots of kids and I thought I'm you know, would have an opportunity to talk uh, a little bit about my vacation. So I've got about 150 slides, if you don't mind. Uh, anyways, back in 2013, I took my six kids and a trailer and we drove 10 and a half thousand kilometers across the country to Tofino on Vancouver Island and back. And uh, on our way back, we, uh, we stopped in uh, at uh, Yellowstone National Park. And I I thought it would be uh, interesting to show a couple of slides of the, of the park to kind of relate back to how forests change and evolve and, and that it's not necessarily a, a, a bad thing. So my young son, youngest son, uh, the park ranger there, is uh, standing beside, well, you've got uh, Old Faithful in the background. And if you look at uh, in the background, it's a bit fuzzy, 
But the hillsides are covered primarily with, uh, with lodgepole pine. You can see the, uh, the, the fumaroles. Uh, basically, Yellowstone National Park is over top of a large caldera, and uh, you know, magma is, occurs only a few kilometers below the surface, hence, uh, hence the geysers. Um, my, uh, my family, we'd stop and, and look at the elk. There's some elk uh, grazing and some bison. They'd be looking at the elk. I'd be looking at the, the trees in the background, more lodgepole pine. Uh, Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, Franklin D. Roosevelt. There's a famous picture, 32nd President of the United States. There was a famous picture of him sitting in his car. Uh, as you know, he had trouble walking. Sitting in his car, a convertible car, with uh, the falls here in the background. I've got a picture of the family in the same. Um, just again, want to point out on the, in, the, in the background, uh, extensive uh, lodgepole pine forests, and if you notice, there's a, there's a little bit of an oddity here, like there's a, there's, there's a dense forest here, it's quite open here, there's a few scattered, what look like to be sticks uh, rising out of the ground, and there's a, kind of a varied forest uh, landscape here, so keep that in mind. My kids are wondering, what am I looking at? You know, after the first rock and after the first uh, a geyser, they kind of were wondering where the gift shop was and what was going to be for lunch. Uh, but I kept taking some pictures, and just to point out, there's a number of snags and chicos uh, from the 1980s fire. There was extensive fires in the 1980s, and tens of thousands of hectares of, uh, of Yellowstone were burned. And there was severe criticism of the Forest Service for letting the fires burn. With lodgepole pine, just like jack pine, there's the, the forest regenerate uh, naturally through use of fire. The fire burns the mature trees, burns the duff layer, creates a, a, a perfect seed bed for seed. The cones of lodgepole pine and jack pine are very similar in that they're serotonous. Uh, they require fire to open up to heat up the cones, uh, and you get very good natural regeneration uh, following. And here's another landscape picture of the park and there's uh, snags and chicos uh, you can't quite see it but the gray haze you see are snags and chicos left over from the fires from the 80s but as you can see the forest is uh, fully regenerated there's some areas where the fire was so intense uh, that the trees didn't come back but overall it, it was magnificent to see uh, such a, a great example of nature uh, doing its thing, ecological restoration by nature, in that this this forest is 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 regenerated. It still has you know challenges and uh, lodgepole pine. I worked uh, for the Forest Service in British Columbia for five years, and and dealt directly with the the uh, the mountain pine beetle epidemic that ha has uh, pretty much run its course in BC, but it is 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 spreading east. Same species, uh, so there's definitely gonna be challenges ahead. But it was amazing to see the 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 regeneration that had taken place after the extensive fires. Okay, so how do we manage for forest health uh, on, on the Crown land? I thought it would be important to run by what we do. If you're not familiar uh, with forest management on Crown land, I'll give you a little bit of uh, background of what, what we do. And uh, although we don't work on private, we do work collaboratively with uh, groups such as uh, the, the Township of the Archipelago and the Biosphere uh, Reserve. And so we are partners in that regard. In uh, managing our forests, we undertake uh, practice of civil culture, which is uh, managing forest establishment, composition and growth. We look at the different tree species and, and the, uh, the ecosystems that we're managing and we make sure that we match the tree species to the appropriate sites. We use three main civil culture systems. We have a selection civil culture system that manages all age forests, typically our hardwood forests. It's about 50% of our allowable cut or the area that we're allowed to cut through that we, we get approved through a, a forest management planning process. And it's a way, it's a one way of improving the health of the forest. So I talked about high grading where they took the best and left the rest. Well now we, we work on removing the, uh, the diseased and dying trees, spacing the healthier trees so that we have uh, an improved forest for the future. Uh, we have a shelter wood system that is more of an even age system that we use to manage our white pine forests, which are mid-tolerant species, so they need a little bit more uh, light uh, conditions than, than, say, the maple. Uh, it's about 40% of our allowable cut, and there's, you can see here, uh, kind of uh, trying to demonstrate the, the process of starting with a mature forest 
undertaking a seeding cut where we space out the trees. This is what it looks like looking up into the crowns. This is what it looks like looking past or through the crowns with the objective of regenerating uh, white pine in the understory, either through natural or artificial means, which is tree planting. We do so some clear cutting. It's a very small amount of our, of our uh, forest management. It's around the one to 3%, tends to occur in small pockets. We use it to regenerate the more sun-loving species such as jack pine and poplar. Again, variety of sizes, not the large scale sizes of clear cuts you see in the, in the in other jurisdiction, jurisdictions. We do use it as a forest restoration uh, technique. We'll take a mixed wood forest, a poor quality uh, balsam fir and, and poplar, and we will uh, carry out a, a clear cut and do civil culture treatments to bring it back to predominantly a uh, red pine and spruce white pine forest. Why would we do that? We don't do it on a, an extensive uh, basis, but we do have a provincial pine policy that says that historically the level of white and red pine in the, in the province was much higher. And so when we carry out forest management plans, uh, an objective is where we harvest uh, red and white pine. We're obligated to, to renew it to red and white pine and where we can to try and carry out treatments that would uh, increase or enhance the amount of red and white pine on the landscape. Not to completely return it to historical levels, but to bring it closer to, to try and in, in increase the, uh, the level on, on the land base. In the last 40 years and since 1997 with Westwind, one of the flagship programs for forest management in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence, of which uh, the French Severn Forest is located, is our tree marking program. We go out to the areas that have been designated for approval in our forest management plan for timber harvesting. We do a site-specific civil culture prescription based on the tree silvics and uh, surveys that we do in the forest, come up with a plan. The tree markers then take that plan and they select the trees for retention or removal with paint based on the prescription. And those folks are provincially trained and certified. We audit the tree marking prior to the area being cut. The Ministry of Natural Resources can also audit us and audit the tree marking. Uh, so there's a checks and balances uh, process in place. And then the area is cut and we move forward. So uh, most of the areas that we uh, manage are marked by tree markers. So the, the actual trees that are gonna come out are selected by, by someone. One of the primary marking objectives is to uh, provide space to the better trees and remove the poorer trees. This was taken from the tree marking guide. There's several tree diseases. Some are considered uh, infectious uh, and, and need are a priority for removals. Other may degrade quality, but We've learned from the past. In the past, uh, marking regimes would, uh, the markers would go in and remove all the diseased trees and clean it out. And we found that by doing that, we'd end up getting die back in the crowns. It was too much of a shock for say a ma maple forest. And so uh, when we go in and remove the poor trees and defects, we don't remove all of them. We, we remove the, the most infectious, but we, re, we need to retain a certain level of stocking to maintain uh, structure and also to, to promote the proper development of, of, of the forest. So tree markers are trained to uh, ma maintain biodiversity by maintaining mass trees, especially if they're rare. There's certain requirements to maintain uh, so many mass trees per hectare. Here's a beech tree with some bear claws on it. Super canopy trees, the white pine that's extending above the, the general canopy, that's considered a super canopy tree. There's a requirement to maintain so many of those per hectare. So the tree markers uh, look out for that. So that individual white pine tree would probably get a blue mark on it in a hardwood forest that would tell the logger, uh, hands off, you're, you're, not, you're not cutting this one because it, it, has a, it has a value. It would be used by, by raptors for perching or, or nesting, that type of thing. Cavity trees, tree markers are trained and required to retain cavity trees. Basically what they do is they'll put a, a no cut buffer, a, a, an inverted red T, Red means stop, approximately 20 meters around the tree. You can see here in the middle picture, there's, uh, uh, there's a nest, so they're trained to look, watch out for the nest. They're required to report their findings. The Ministry of Natural Resources is, is informed and their biologists come out and confirm whether the, whether the nest is active. And depending on the species, there's different sizes of buffers, no treatment, timing windows, different types of prescriptions. Uh, we call these area of concerns that are implemented on a on a site by site basis. Uh, we monitor the timber harvest, the timber harvest, the hauling, the road construction, installation of water crossings. We're involved in that activity. We uh, we offer training for the loggers, put on training, 
encourage careful logging. There's uh, standards in our forest management plan that have to be followed with respect to, uh, to rutting and site damage and trail coverage with the intent of ensuring that we have a healthy forest. Uh, once we're done timber harvest. Uh, here's an example of pine shelter wood block. I'm actually, I might be dressed in a suit, but I'm just as comfortable in a, a pair of work boots and a hard hat and a cruising vest. I wasn't sure whether I should wear my zip off uh, quick dry pants uh, and hiking boots. I wasn't sure whether we were going to do some tree planting today, but uh, uh, oh, and by the way, every day is Earth Day for a forester. Uh, <laughs> So here's an example of a block uh, that I was involved in developing the prescription for, um, for the second cut in 2010, auditing the tree marking and then monitoring the harvest. Uh, this, this particular block uh, had the skid trails laid out well in advance uh, by flagging. The techniques they use include uh, where, they, where they hit low, wet areas. Uh, the, uh, the technician will change colors to blue, so the blue to the operator means low wet and they will then install uh, corduroy which is cutting up trees to to basically create kind of a blanket to cross over the low wet area these areas are often logged in the winter time so the the machine operator may not know that there's a low wet area there so um, very very good practices so this area has been cut twice the regeneration is uh, oh, approximately three to, to to five meters tall and under the uh, the white pine shelterwood civil culture system we would go back one more time and do what's called a final removal cut. Typically when the regeneration is, is uh, six meters tall, 18 feet tall, the reason for that is uh, the white pine weevil uh, like to, uh, to attack the leaders of, uh, of the young white pine regeneration. They fly over, they can see the regeneration. Once they get above six meters tall, they seem to be less susceptible to the weevil. And, and so by maintaining a, an overstory, the weevil don't see the young white pine as well. And uh, so the intent there is to just hold off until the, the young regeneration reaches a, a height that uh, less susceptible to weevil, and then we do a final removal. But even when we do a final removal cut, there's requirements to leave so many wildlife veteran trees per hectare behind, so many super canopy trees, uh, cavity trees. And so our forests now, either when we clear cut or even when we undertake a shelter wood cut, when we're finally done, they often have quite a varied structure and they do not look like the, you know, sort of the open field conditions that you may have seen uh, in the past. We renew the forest. Uh, this picture here is uh, mechanical site preparation to create those uh, open seed bed conditions that I talked to you about. Here's that picture again with the, uh, the white pine regeneration. We do, uh, we do tree planting and, and we also do tending of the forest. Of course, working on crown land, working with the government, you can't do anything without uh, extensive reporting. We have compliance plans, we have to do regeneration surveys, we have to fill out annual reports. We go through an independent forest audit every five years. Uh, the next five-year audit is coming up this September. We go through a forest stewardship council audit every five years. It too is coming up in September. We get, we're lucky enough to have two audits, major audits going on at the same time. And the FSC folks come every year and they come out and they look at different things. They'll talk to operators about health and safety. They'll look at how we're dealing with uh, uh, f uh, First Nations. They'll look at the regeneration of the forest and our certification under both of those, those schemes uh, is dependent on a successful outcome uh, in our audits. Back at the property, I've got uh, American Beach. I'm probably gonna have to take down. There's one that's really close to the house, so I'm concerned about that. I, I do fell trees, but I'm not that good. I've even got elm, I've got ash, but you know, at the same time, I've got some really nice specimens of red oak, got a happy face there, and maple, got lots of maple. Some's in decline because it's sitting up on top of the, the rocks and with the, the drought conditions, that has, that's, going to, that's going to be a, a, an issue for me. Optimistic that uh, we'll have forest cover around our, our property and the kids can, they've got some mountain bike uh, trails there and uh, I need the boys to have something to do because they're quite wild and so I keep them busy. To wrap up, I believe that uh, the forests of Georgian Bay are, they're ever changing. There's, we, they're always going to change. They're never static, but I think they're resilient. And I just, I think of, uh, I think of uh, the diseases that uh, on the crown that we've gone through over the last uh, 20 years and talking to Joe and being out and doing surveys, free to grow surveys on these areas that had the jack pine budworm and there's a healthy new forest coming up and uh, dealing with the, the root rot pockets. I believe the forests are resilient and thinking about back to when the area was first logged and they stripped it, like there, there was almost nothing left and yet, we have 
it's my understanding we have one of the largest intact landscapes of white pine in eastern North America, back when we got our first uh, Forest Stewardship Council uh, audit done in 2001. And my understanding is that it's, it's one of the most extensive, uh, yes, it has roads and it's bisected by, uh, by the highways and, of course, there's forestry roads. But very, if you fly over the, the French Severn Forest and you fly over uh, the, uh, the landscape of uh, eastern Georgian Bay, it's amazing. It is just a solid, it's solid green. And I think with good stewardship, it's always going to be here. So here's my, uh, here's my young budding forest ranger between Harold's Point and the Visitor Center at Kilbear. Future uh, Adam Van Coverden, maybe. And my daughter, crazy daughter, she wants to be a lifeguard. Uh, <laughs> she's jumping off the rocks there. And your classic Georgian Bay rocks and, and view. And it was amazing. We, we went out west. And then last year, we went east to Nova Scotia. And I mean, the Rocky Mountains are, are wonderful, and the West Coast and the East Coast are, are great, but to tell you the truth, that we, uh, we really enjoy the, the, the big waters of Georgian Bay. Spent a lot of time at uh, Kilbear Park, and I'm, I'm just so happy to, uh, to be part of managing this, this uh, forest. So, thank you.